is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Joining us today for Episode 94 is Jungian analyst and author Dr. Nancy Swift Ferlotti in Aspen, Colorado. She received a doctorate in psychology from Saybrook University and trained as a Jungian analyst at the Research and Training Center for Depth Psychology, according to C.G. Jung and Marie-Louise von Franz in Zurich, Switzerland, and at the C.G. Jung Institute of Los Angeles, where she later served as president. Dr. Swift Ferlotti is a founding member and past president of the Philemon Foundation and was actively involved in the publication of Jung's Red Book. She now serves on the board of the Kairos Film Foundation, which created the movies Matter of Heart, The World Within, and the Remembering Jung video series. She is a member of the C.G. Jung Institute of Colorado and the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts, and sits on the boards of Pacifica Graduate Institute, the Smithsonian National Asian Museum, and the Aspen Music Festival and School. Recently, she established two endowments that focus on understanding and resolving human trauma, the Carl Gustav Jung Professorial Endowment in Analytical Psychology at the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at the University of California, Los Angeles, and the Aurel Shalit Carlsberg Foundation Research Fellowship in Behavioral Neuroscience at Oxford. Her company, Recollections LLC, edits and publishes first-generation Jungian's unpublished writings. Most recently, Eric Neumann's two-volume manuscript, The Roots of Jewish Consciousness. She is co-editor with Dr. Aurel Shalit of the book The Dream and Its Amplification, which we'll be giving away this week on Twitter, and contributor to several other books, including A Clear and Present Danger, Turbulent Times Creative Minds, and the human soul lost in transition at the dawn of a new era. Along with fellow Jungian analyst Dr. James Hollis, she is co-executive producer of the new film Soul Heal by Jose Enrique Pardo. It features both Dr. Swift Ferlotti and Dr. Hollis discussing the wounding and healing of men. It's now or never, they say, to achieve wholeness or face destruction. You can rent the film for 72 hours for $1.99. All of the net proceeds will be donated to charitable organizations whose missions align with that of the film. This year, Dr. Swift Ferlotti will be delivering the annual Fay Lecture Series at the Macmillan Institute for Jungian Studies in Houston, Texas, which will also be live-streamed. The subject is her long-standing interest in Mesoamerican mythology, specifically the Quiche Maya creation myth, the Popol Vuh. Next year, she will be speaking at the Uranos Conference, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, held April 28th through May 1st in Ascana, Switzerland. Other presenters include speaking of Jung guests, Murray Stein, Leonard Cruz, Lance Owens, and Frank McMillan. Please visit the website speakingofyoung.com where you will find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This interview is being recorded on Wednesday, October 6th, 2021, through the magic of Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Swift Verlotti. Well, thank you so much for having me. It is my pleasure to finally speak with you. You recently starred in a film titled Soul Heal with a frequent guest on this podcast, James Hollis. I just watched it this week. You can rent the film for $1.99 and you're given 72 hours from the time you start watching to watch it as many times as you'd like. And I would love it if you would share with us how you became involved in that film. First of all, I want to say it's really a fabulous film. And um, I just feel like anything Jim Hollis does is fabulous. He's truly, truly a very, very special human being and has been an incredible mentor to me over the years. Um, The idea was actually his and he approached this um, really super talented filmmaker, Jose Pardo, 
And the two of them joined up and talked about how they could they could create a film on this subject. And for whatever reason, uh, Jim felt that I should be interviewed um, in the film, uh, which I agreed to do. And so I did. And um, uh, it turned out that it was the two of us being interviewed with, of course, Jose giving a lot of information and then doing the animation and the and and all the work on the film, adding the music and just turning it into a, a world class documentary. And I have to say that it has recently been accepted at the Cannes Short Fest uh, and also is is a semifinalist in Vancouver at their uh, Short Fest. So that's very, very exciting. Um, but I, I have worked with uh, Jim Hollis for years. We started out together actually on the Philemon Foundation back in uh, 2004. Uh, we were both founding members and he was the vice president of the Philemon Foundation. And that's when I started getting to know him. And then over the years, our paths have crossed many, many times. And he, it turned out that he uh, became my dissertation advisor when my uh, when the advisor that I had at the time passed away suddenly from liver cancer. Uh, Jim was kind enough to step in and take over. So mm -hmm. um, he knew my work uh, very cl very very clearly, and um, uh, we spent quite a bit of time together. Uh, when I was going through uh, my PhD program, he was actually the chair of that program. So I really got to know him and, and um, it was very kind of him to think of me for this film. Um, it's a very important documentary. Not only is it just spectacularly uh, done as you saw, I mm -hmm. mean, it's beautiful, yeah. and so interesting, so uh, professional. Um, but the message is extremely important. Yes. Um, the whole concept is something that, that I have been um, thinking about, contemplating, worried about for years and years. This, uh, the issue of soul, the issue of masculinity and femininity and relationship and the, the level of violence in not only our country, but the whole world. Mm -hmm. Um, that results from these super patriarchal attitudes um, that um, is something that that we're we're really seeing an uptick in our country uh, in that area with all the the white nationalists and all these these anti-abortion laws and uh, anti-health laws for women just the the patriarchal suppression of the feminine is um, is really getting out of hand. And not only is it terrible for women in the culture, but it's terrible for men too. Um, and so the it's this this little film I think has has appeared on the scene at a perfect time. The message is so important. Um, and I hope it does have a big impact. You know, it's 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 hard to change these uh, longstanding cultural attitudes mm -hmm. about how we raise our raise our boys, what it what it is to be masculine, um, and and then their own instinctual nature about being masculine. How how can we shift that attitude so that it it becomes uh, healthier for them and healthier for women and healthier for the culture. And so this, um, that whole topic just segues perfectly into these two other projects right now that I'm um, working on. You mm -hmm. mentioned that I will be giving the, the Fay lecture next month in Houston. And the title of that is the splendor of the Maya 
a journey into the shadows at the dawn of creation. And it's about Mesoamerican culture. It's about the Maya in particular and about their creation myth, but it really was the creation myth of Mesoamerica, the Popol Vuh. And it's just an incredible, uh, detailed, uh, interesting, thoughtful, um, funny creation myth that starts out with uh, not just a god, but it's it's always a god and goddess, you could say. It's the masculine and feminine together. Mm -hmm. It's that unity. So that's a different template than what we're used to in the West. Yeah, sure is. Separating the the matriarchy from the patriarchy. This is it's all mother, father, it's grand, grandmother, grandfather, everything is a unity and they come together in council. So it's, it's not just an isolated voice, so to speak. It's not, it, it begins, creation begins with the word, but it's the word out of council. It's the word out of a multiplicity, uh, which in Jungian psychology is so much healthier than the, the splitting of the opposites where you've got the masculine on one side and the feminine on the other. And so that really arose as a, as a very interesting idea for me. And I, I was uh, attracted to that mythology very early on uh, when I was a youngster, I had a number of dreams with some very powerful uh, images, images of jaguars stalking me, images of double-headed snakes, snakes with, with two uh, heads on them, uh, a bird and a jaguar, uh, all these strange um, symbols that I never even imagined. And they're certainly not those images that we see in in uh, Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to delve a little deeper and discovered that uh, these were images from um, Mesoamerican mythology, and, and that's what really piqued my curiosity. I needed to understand why my psyche grabbed those images and and gave those to me. And what was that all about? Right. Um, and of course, when you're doing dream work, um, you delve deeper and deeper into the images that the psyche gives you to try to understand what it is specifically about that image that your psyche wants you to know. And um, so I, uh, that's exactly what I did. And of course, at that young age, I think some of these dreams are from as far back as, as 11, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't, I wasn't really doing any dream work then. I, right. I was just writing them down, keeping them in the back of my mind, pondering about them over the years. And, and then I finally was able to place them. Um, but that's what, that's what ignited my interest. And, um, and it, it, the Maya in Mesoamerica had such an incredibly huge civilization. It was so sophisticated with the writing system. Uh, they had advanced um, mathematics, astronomy. Uh, they were deep thinkers. They had a, a writing system and an alphabet that allowed them to express very sophisticated ideas. And uh, hundreds of thousands of people living down there. For the listeners who are not familiar with the Maya civilization, where exactly were they, and during what time period? Uh, they uh, were located and still are in uh, Guatemala, Mexico, um, uh, El Salvador, and Belize, okay. and Honduras, mm -hmm. and uh, they were in the Yucatan area of Mexico, uh, not central, central Mexico, where the, the Aztecs mm -hmm. uh, lived, 
uh, in the in the Mexico City area. It's further south, and they were a group of people who lived about the same time as the Olmecs, who were on the the coast. Um, and we're talking about 2000 BC and the height of the, the height of their civilization was around, um, I would say 200 AD, um, around that period, they, their civilization collapsed for the first time around 150 AD, and then it collapsed again, 900 AD. So this okay. was long before the Spanish came. But this was a long, long time ago, and they, yeah. they built very extensive um, cities just uh, in the central um, Guatemalan area, uh, Mirador Basin, which is a pre-classic area. There are over 51 cities and all sorts of other little smaller towns, I mean, hundreds, and huge pyramids, actually, the biggest pyramid in the world was built in that area, not not height wise, but, but uh, the kind of the width of this pyramid, mm -hmm. absolutely huge. And the, the sad part of this whole thing for me is that their civilization was almost completely wiped out by the Spanish when they arrived, yeah, certainly after those two collapses in their civilization. And then the, 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 the smallpox epidemic, which is also a curiosity, about 85% of the indigenous people there were, were um, wiped out by the smallpox that the Spanish brought with them into that area. Mm. So it was very easy for them to conquer Mm -hmm. after wiping out all that all those people but um it's a civilization that that rivals egypt um assyria the indus river valley uh greece it just very very sophisticated and, and it's right on our own continent and nobody knows about right. it nobody people don't talk about it right that's why when you ask that question where were the maya i mean this these are truly incredible people. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and here we hardly know. And there's still about 6 million Maya living in, that, in Guatemala. It's the largest indigenous group in Guatemala. And some here in the United States as well. Yes, so, many in the United States. This, this book that you're referring to, the Popol Vuh, translated as Book of the Council, Book of the Community, Book of the People, the Sacred Book. It was their equivalent to the Christian Bible, right? And was held in very deep reverence by them. Yes, yes, it was. Absolutely, it was. It was their, uh, it was their book of vision. And through that book, it was read by priests or, or diviners. They would be able to um, have clear vision to see all that happened in the past and all that would happen in the future. And yes, it was their Bible. From what I understand, it was uh, largely an oral tradition that was not written down until much later. And there is a copy of it that is available online through the Newberry Library here in Chicago. It's a private library that specializes in rare books and manuscripts. And the Newberry has made the book available online for researchers through The Ohio State University, and I will provide a link to that in the show notes. So what can you tell us about your, your Jungian perspective on the contents of the Popol Vuh? Well, what, what I have done in studying the Popol Vuh is, of course, look at it from the, um, uh, the ethnologist's point of view, look at it from the, the archaeologist's point of view, the anthropologist's point of view, the historian point of view. Most people don't look at it uh, psychologically. Mm -hmm. 
So that's what I decided to do to, to try to understand the culture through this important writing that emerged right out of that, um, to see how the, how the people thought, to see what was important to them, to see how they established their civilization. And um, so I decided to, to look at it psychologically, look at it from a Jungian point of view and, and amplify, which is what we do in Jungian psychology when, when we're working with dreams or um, any kind of visionary material, we amplify the images in that material to um, be able to get a greater sense of what it means symbolically. And so uh, I actually take the last part there uh, in this particular creation myth, the world is created uh, three times and destroyed three times, basically because the gods don't get it right. And um, they, they attempt the first creation and it's not good enough. The gods are interested in and attempting to create uh, a world where humans uh, think and ponder and respect the gods and um, make offerings to the god and, and maintain a relationship with the gods. And so in the first three creations, the, um, their, their attempts fail because the, they first off create all the animals and the animals don't talk, they just uh, chatter and, and squawk. And so um, that's not okay. So then the animals are left on the earth and they're, they're there to be eaten and, um, uh, and, and reside with the trees and the plants and all of that. And then they try again, and then they create um, mud people. They, they use mud for the creation of the so-called humans. And they soon realize that when it rains, the mud people are washed away. So that's not gonna work. And so they're very disappointed and they go into council again to try to figure out what to do. And, and they come up with the idea of creating people out of wood. Uh, and they do, they create these wood people, but they also don't, they don't have heart, they don't have feeling, they don't respond to the gods in any way. So that's not gonna work. And they're also very uh, cruel to the animals and all the, the instruments in their homes. And so the gods uh, create a huge flood that uh, washes them all away. And then those remaining wood people who are left on, on earth, are turned into monkeys. So again, in our in this particular myth, we've got the flood, just like we have the, the flood in uh, the Bible. So you have these repeating motifs over and over again, similar motifs throughout mythologies all across the globe. So they finally decide the gods get together again in council. This is the God of the sky, the God of, of the sea. And uh, they decide to bring in uh, two very ancient gods who are the mother, father, grandmother, grandfather of all the diviners, the ones who, who can see into the future and see into the past and, and read the, the calendars of days, which will allow them to see what's coming in the future. And they give the task of creating the fourth world um, to those, uh, the ancient mother, father, mm -hmm. which they do. And they, they decide to create humans from corn, 
And so they take corn and they take water and they mix those two things together and they create humans. And this time it works. Those humans um, uh, are the ones on, on the earth in the fourth world, which is where we are right now mm -hmm. in their fourth world. And then the, the myth, um, now that we have these humans who are capable of honoring the gods and, and thinking, pondering, um, and um, uh, living in a respectful way with the gods in a reciprocal way, then the myth goes into uh, the birth of uh, hero twins, two sets of hero twins. And the essence of, of their task, which I get into in greater detail and really amplify, that's a, that's a very serious hero's journey. Mm -hmm. Their task is to clear away the demons of the underworld before the earth can actually be created, before the, 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 the sun can dawn, um, the sun and moon can actually dawn in the sky and begin moving and the whole cycle of that, that world will begin. So this is a very interesting aspect of the, the myth and it's very, Jungian psychological, you could say, because these two, first the, the father and uncle attempt to clear away the demons in the underworld, but they fail. And then their, their sons um, are called to do the same thing by the demons to enter the underworld to play in the ball game, which is a, a was a very important part of Mesoamerican culture, the, the, um, the, the ball game. Mm -hmm. And they play with the gods and it, it's a very interesting uh, um, kind of very creative drama that takes place. And a lot of humor there between the, the the demons and um, just to give you an example, the names of the demons are just hysterical. Of course, there's one death and seven death, but there's also gathered blood and flying scab, plus demon, jaundice demon, bone staff and skull staff, sweeping demon and stabbing demon, Lord wing and pack strap. And each of these demons will um, have a very negative effect on the, the humans on earth. Um, they'll cause bleeding, they'll cause demon or the humans to die on the road and all the, all these things that afflict humans are related to the, uh, to these demons. Anyways, who are these demons? Well, these are, this is the shadow and the complexes yeah. that we all deal with in, um, in our psychological work. Uh, so in this creation myth, the two hero twins go down and they have to neutralize all these demons, which represents neutralizing the complexes, dealing with the complexes and the shadow and making all of that conscious and in effect depotentiating those so that the individual can be more whole carrying uh, both the, uh, the conscious side and bringing all of this into their consciousness. So it, it, it adds to their wholeness, but it also um, allows them to not be overtaken, let's say overtaken on the road by a uh, pus demon, which would be a certain complex that a per mm -hmm. person has. So mm -hmm. we're looking at a myth from, from before Christ was born that is talking about how to, how to clear out all this negativity in, in um, 
people's psyches, all the arrogance, all the, uh, the lying, the bad negative traits, the, the anger, um, all, the, all those things that uh, have a really negative impact on not only individuals, but will have an impact on the creation of a, of a society, of a culture, of a civilization. So these people are trying to clear that out before the sun dawns and humans then have a respectful um, relationship, reciprocal relationship with the gods with, without all these human um, uh, shadow and complex aspects. So I talk about uh, in the amplification, the um, all the all the images that appear, and what they mean, and why why it really makes sense, and um, it's just fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. You mentioned that myths reflect an emanation from the collective unconscious that impact our culture and that the myths are not reflective of an individual process, but rather the cultural collective process um, leading to the development and, and the establishment of the civilization. So what then can we learn from what happened to the Maya and and what do you, how do you see that reflected in what's happening now to us, to the earth? Well, um, what also grabbed my attention was the sudden collapse of mm-hmm. their environment yeah. in, in um, 150 AD. And uh, then the final collapse in 900 AD. Uh, they had lived there for a very long time. And this particular group, uh, especially the Maya in central Guatemala lived in a rainforest. I mean, it's still a beautiful rainforest that um, uh, the archeologist who's, who's uncovering all the, the ruins down there is really trying to protect that from mm-hmm. being burned down like it has been all around that area. Um, but if you think about creating a, a huge civilization like that in the center of the rainforest, the soil is not very good. I mean, you've got to be extremely talented in terms of agriculture if you're going to sustain hundreds of thousands of people in, in that kind of an area, which the Maya did. They figured out how to, how to grow enough food to survive in an area where the soil is very thin and uh, not terribly productive. I mean, Mm -hmm. they had to supplement it with um, soil that they would take out of what they call these civales, which are like these big pools of water. And um, they managed to do it. And actually another interesting fact is that the people at that time were about, between five, nine and six feet tall, which tells you they were really getting a lot of nutrition. Mm -hmm. And then after the collapse, uh, they lost their height and they didn't have the the nutrition that they had during that uh, pre-classic era. But what we think happened early on was that, uh, which, which is why it's a good lesson for us. The, the Maya started building bigger and bigger pyramids and using more and more plaster on, their, um, on the outside of their pyramids and on their, their causeways. They had this huge freeway system that, that traveled from city to city all over that area. And they uh, covered the, the causeways with plaster and mm-hmm. Towards the beginning, when they started creating these structures, they the plaster was just uh, let's say an inch thick, and then after quite a number of years, the plaster 
got to be 15 inches thick on the causeways and on the on the pyramids. And of course, they would it, it, the pyramids were all painted and they were very, very impressive. And um, the archaeologist who works in that area, a guy named Richard Hansen, believes that the reason for the collapse was the increased use of plaster, which required um, cutting down a lot of the trees in the rainforest and burning the green wood to get the heat hot enough to actually create the plaster. Mm -hmm. uh, from the lime, uh, that there was a lot of runoff from that process, uh, especially if you're depleting trees in the rainforest, you're going to get a lot more runoff and the soil is going to collapse even, become even worse than it ever was uh, normally. And a lot of that runoff uh, ran back into those large pools of water that they depended on for their, their, um, their drinking supply and also to create the fertile soil. And it created uh, like plaster caps so that, that all of the water in the soil was now not available. And so in effect, what happened was that their desire to build bigger and more impressive structures um, for reasons we don't quite understand, but knowing history, it's most likely they were trying to impress themselves and, and impress other city states around them. Mm -hmm. We know there was a lot of conflict between varying city states. It was always fighting going on between one group and another in that area. And um, they would go to war constantly and, and, and try to take prisoners and then and then uh, demand tribute from other city states uh so there was this getting kind of a warlike situation a lot of conflicts and um and then at the same time there were a lot of natural catastrophes so you have droughts terrible terrible droughts you've got earthquakes you've got um a lot of uh, natural catastrophes. So he thinks that it was it was really a combination of all those things that um, made it impossible for the Maya to live in that area any longer. It collapsed right there, and then a lot of the the Maya moved further north into um, Yucatan, Mayapan, Kalakmul, those areas and also further south into the, into the highlands, uh, which is where the Quiche um, uh, lived later on uh, and lived um, at the time when the, um, the Popol Vuh was actually written down mm -hmm. uh, or copied, I should say. So what we can learn from this, we're, we're, going through a huge catastrophe that is worldwide with global climate change. The Maya had a basically a global climate change disaster. Okay. And yet it was it was limited to their area. It was it was caused by um, uh, what humans did and certain thoughtlessness about how to deal with nature so the balance between between humans and nature shifted within that power balance the and the, with all the fighting and everything else that was going on and that is that's what humans do and yeah. that's such a tragedy we never learn from history from collapses of civilizations and why they occurred and how now we've gotten to the point where the whole world is, is participating in a collapse, mm -hmm. in a huge shift. And we don't know whether we're going to be able to survive this or, or pull the world out of it. There's also the issue of increased infertility because of all the plastics. And so we don't know what's going to happen.
You know, we really don't know. Humans tend to be quite short-sighted. And uh, we think about what, what we want for our world and what we want for our families and our lives uh, in periods of, of months and years, not periods of um, decades and, and hundreds of years and well into the future. So for some reason, it's, it's hard to get our minds around the fact that in 50 years, uh, we may all be starving to death or there may be some serious catastrophe. Now, what's also interesting about the Maya is that they had this book, the Popol Vuh, and they had their ritual calendars, their, their divinatory calendars, and they had diviners who were able to look into the future and see what was approaching. Mm -hmm. And so they had the long view, at least the diviners did, but this, it, the other side of human instinct to, to take the short view and, and focus on power and greed and, and vanity and all of that seems to have, have uh, taken precedent. And I think that's where we are. You had mentioned that about the Maya, that their worldview was focused on a healthy relationship with the gods and with nature. So is that how they started out and then eventually that deteriorated? Yes, I would say that that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And that that's human nature? I think that's human nature. If you really, you just look at our own country and the, our founding fathers here in the United States started out with these these wonderful yes. values and ideals mm -hmm. and we've really lost that and of course there was a lot of one per one founder not liking the other and conflict and criticism and all of that you have that though when you're when you're in discussion in council trying trying to create something important it also goes back to what was covered in the film Soul Heal, which we were talking about at the beginning, and men and hostility and aggression and how they're raised and how they see themselves and how they see each other and how they see women. And mostly women do inner work, right? Majority of the people who are doing inner work are, are women and not men. And so we've got all these wounded men walking around wreaking havoc. And so I, I highly encourage everyone to watch that film. It's only 23 minutes long uh, and a dollar 99. So it's, it's certainly manageable, but hearing you speak about the Maya and the collapse is, is making me think of the things that you and Dr. Hollis spoke about in soul heal. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. That is, that's, that's the problem. And, and you see, even back um, before in the before the birth of Christ, we've got this this problem, you know, in in the Americas, uh, all the fighting, all the the the, the, the strong, aggressive, angry, um, uh, power drives and and vanity and all of that taking place. The issue, it's the issue of the masculine. Now, women also, I have to say, we're not, we're certainly not perfect by any means. Mm -hmm. um, we too strive for wholeness and we strive for an, uh, to integrate our feminine with our masculine. We have a masculine side that can be just as aggressive as, any man's masculinity. Yeah. So we too have to pay attention to the masculine. It's something Dr. Hollis said in the movie that I think can be applied to women just as much as men is he said, you become driven by power when inwardly you don't have it. 
When you feel it inside you, you don't have to keep demonstrating it in the outside world. It's compensatory to that deep sense of interior inadequacy and feeling of being an imposter. That's absolutely true. That is, that is absolutely true. And that's the, the, what we try to, to heal in Jungian analysis is, is to return that that genuine sense of authority and power to the individual and also to connect, help that individual connect to what we call the greater self, which is, would be the equivalent of the Maya connecting to the gods. It's that inner wisdom, the wisdom of the, uh, collective unconscious, that soulful piece Mm -hmm. of ourselves. And when we're connected to that, then the ego takes a a back seat to that connection. And power is not the driving issue. There's no sense of of feeling weak or insecure Mm -hmm. because there's a solid connection to knowing one's place in the world and that makes a that makes all the difference in the world yeah and so the maya started out with the right values and the right relationship the relationship between spirit and nature but somehow that gets lost along the way and i think right now so many people are are lost they don't they have not held spirit and and nature together um, through their soul. And that's that's the problem. You know, the other project that I'm dealing with, which I mentioned to you, was a real concern for these um, Afghan women. I've been involved with this Asian University for Women for years, and uh the uh, head of that school managed to evacuate 148 of the students and alumni from Afghanistan the day before it all shut down. Now, if you look at what's going on in that country, you've got the Taliban taking over. That is a raging example of yes. extreme power and specifically power against the feminine. I mm-hmm. mean, they, they really are striving to, to completely remove all, all sense of power and control from, from women. I mean, it's just, it's just a tragic situation. Um, and I'm so happy that at least these women have been able to be evacuated and they were evacuated to a, an army base in Michigan and they're getting waiting for their green cards and then they're being placed in uh, colleges and universities across the country um, and uh, I thought that these women are definitely going to need mental health support so mm-hmm. I enlisted the help of the uh, International Jungian Association, the IAP, to put out the word to a- activate uh, our Jungian network to um, volunteer to work with these women to help them make that difficult adjustment uh, to living in the United States. I mean, ne- these are women who have left their families, they've left their home, they've mm-hmm. left everything they've known behind. And they don't know whether they'll ever be able to go back. They don't know what's going to happen to their families. I mean, it, it's just, just absolutely awful. And I'm sure the amount of sadness, fear, and despair that these women are experiencing is just quite immense. And then making the adjustment to uh, – going to school in an American university as opposed to Asian University for Women, which is in in Chittagong, Bangladesh, with all other women from Afghanistan and 
Pakistan and India and all over Asia and, and um, Africa. It's a different world here. Mm-hmm. And how are they going to make that adjustment? Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, but what really makes me so sad is to think that there are men like the Taliban who really are willing to kill women for the smallest little things that they do. They don't want them educated. They want them to stay home. They want them to be completely covered up so that nobody can see them. I mean, what a horrible thought. It's, it's just um, unspeakable that there are men who, are, who feel so threatened by mm-hmm. women that they have to do this to them. Kind of collectively. And it reminds me of uh, something you said in Soul Heal, you were talking about the projection of evil, and how it all gets put on the feminine. Yes, it does. The, the, the feminine, well, we're the, we're the mothers, which is talked about in that movie, we, we represent Mother Nature, Mother Nature gives life and takes life away. Um, uh, the, the feminine goddesses were so potent for, for so long on this earth, and they still are in a, uh, you can't get rid of that, that power, which mm-hmm. then turns into a threat for a man. Mm-hmm. But um, men, are ra- men are born from women, men are raised by women, and it's their psychological job to separate from the mother to find their own unique self. And and they do that in part through their own hero's journey, uh, whatever that is for them, to separate from the mother and and, uh, learn who they are and develop a relationship to her, but not necessarily remain under her power uh, to go off and be a secure kind, compassionate human being who, who is creative. And unfortunately, a lot of men uh, don't succeed. And that's where initiation rituals and rites used to come into play. Yeah. In lots of cultures, they were specifically um, formulated to help the, the man take that step outside of the world of the the mothers into the world of the fathers to become who they are, which is men. Now, if that doesn't happen, then what remains is a fear of the feminine, which is what Eric Neumann writes about a lot. He's got a wonderful book called The Fear of the Feminine. And um, uh, men remain fearful that the their mothers, so to speak, the feminine, uh, has the power, holds on to the power, and they don't have it. Mm-hmm. And, and they could be harmed by the power that the, the so-called mothers uh, maintain and maintain over them. So as, as you mentioned earlier, a sense of inferiority, a sense of lack of their own authority or power um, causes causes a real uh, disconnect there between the masculine and the feminine, where the feminine, then they project uh, all this this, um, fear and um, dislike and hatred onto the feminine because they're afraid that the the so-called mothers are gonna come back and, and completely diminish them. And so basically, they haven't found themselves. And, and all these men who want to cover women up, who want to take women's rights away, what are they afraid of? I mean, it's an internal thing. And it's, it basically goes back to them. They haven't fully separated from, from, their, from their mother or from what they feel internally is the mother archetype, the the great mother, they haven't 
pulled themselves out of that um, early, as Neumann would say, Ouroboros, where they're still in the womb of the mother. Um, they haven't established themselves as, as uh, solid, knowing, strong, masculine beings separate from the mother, but respectful of the, the, what the mother offered and respectful of the feminine. What you would like is a wholeness in the men where they're conscious of their, their strong sense of authority as masculine beings who also have the eros and the, and the softness of the feminine the softness and the fierceness of the feminine. And those two things can reside as a wholeness together. And you like to see that psychologically in all men and all women. And then that way men and women are able to stand together in relationship and respect each other. Um, but unfortunately that doesn't happen. There are a lot of uh, uh, people who don't get to that point. And so instead you've got a tremendous amount of projection of their own insecurities and inferiorities onto the other. And we see this in racism and we see this in, in uh, anti-feminism. And unfortunately with the Taliban, it's, it's become a culture. It's not just the individual who is not individuated, who hasn't, um, hasn't brought together his internal masculine and feminine sides, but it's, it's a culture where that is played out in a larger way and, and, and that split is, um, that split is, um, is deeply established in their, the way they live their lives and the way they see the world as a necessity for them, which is really unfortunate. I mean, that is taking the splitting of the psyche into the most dangerous and toxic place when it becomes cultural like that. You know, you see this with, with individuals but when it's gotten this entrenched in their belief system, it is, it's just hard to believe that it actually exists, but it does. And we're seeing the horrors of it. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us, Dr. Swift for Lottie. It certainly does bring in a different perspective and and I hope that the listeners will take something away from that. And before we wrap up here today, I would like to again mention this year's annual Fay Lecture Series, which you will be delivering on November 12th, 13th, and 14th. That is a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It is in person at the Jung Center in Houston, Texas, but it will also be live streamed. And there are two separate links you can find them in the show notes for this episode, episode 94. Again, the title is The Splendor of the Maya, A Journey into the Shadows at the Dawn of Creation. I just want to say, um, I mean, this segue from talking about the Taliban to jumping yeah. to the Maya, we have so much to learn. We really, I think, have lost our connection between spirit and nature. And we need to find that again. And this Maya material for me is, is a really important reminder of how important that is. Our relationship to the gods, so to speak, our relationship to psyche, our relationship to mother nature. And um, so uh, I hope you join me and we can have interesting discussions about this. Um, but I, ultimately, I hope we save our planet, this beautiful planet. I don't want to go to Mars. I don't want to no, go. No, I don't either. I want to stay right here yep. and 
um, and save this planet for my grandchildren and my great grandchildren. And um, remember the importance of uh, Mother Nature. Please visit the website Speaking of Jung, that's J U N G dot com, for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This episode is also available on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music. And it will be available later in the week on our YouTube channel, Jungi and Laura. You can also listen to this podcast on your Amazon Echo device, simply by saying, Alexa, play speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. Links to Amazon's new Echo devices can be found in the show notes. So with special thanks to Frank McMillan, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung.